So welcome everybody. Um, we have got just under an hour. Um, my name is um, Phil Ferrerile. I'm a consultant child psychiatrist uh, and a psychotherapist by background. Um, I am also the clinical director of our children and young people services in Surrey and Borders. Um, and I'm delighted to be here alongside my colleagues. I'll, in, I'll let Catherine introduce herself and then Joe will intro, introduce herself. Hello, everybody. Good to good to meet you in this strange world of um, this this technical meeting. Um, I am a consultant, child, parent, and family psychiatrist and psychotherapist, and uh, joined SABP Trust about six months ago, uh, just before lockdown. Um, so most people I've met only through this digital world, um, and my role in SABP is to connect up across Surrey with. Uh, all the different organisations and voluntary sector, uh, social care, local authority, and to really think about families from the very beginning of life. Um, and I'm very pleased to be involved in this webinar with you, where we, just for this time until two o'clock, join together people from a, a huge number of different professions, actually. The list is really impressive in terms of the, the way in which we've become a multidisciplinary small community for this time. So uh, I'll pass over to Joe Cooks, who is going to start us off actually with with our topic so we can get going over to you joe great thanks catherine uh hi everybody uh my name is joe cooks i work for a very small charity called surrey youth focus um and our purpose um is to um, advocate for the voluntary sector um who work with children and families across <laughs> surrey um to make sure um that the amazing work that they're doing across surrey is uh valued and known about um, and also we collaborate a bit like Catherine was saying that she does on behalf of SABP. Uh, that's my job title. I'm a collaboration manager and my role is to collaborate across the whole system of, uh, of children, and young people and families uh, to ensure that we uh, work together as effectively as we can to improve the um, lives of our children and young people here in Surrey. Um, so I've just been at Surrey Youth Focus for since January, uh, but prior to that, I've worked in Surrey for a long time in various other guises. So um, I know the area well. Uh, Catherine and Phil have asked me to kick off. Um, and so what I really wanted to say was um, over during COVID, some of you may have seen our last seminar uh, webinar. Um, during COVID, we with colleagues across across the system actually asked children and young people and families how they were faring what they were enjoying about lockdown what they were not enjoying um, and what their concerns and worries were um, and joe p um, if there's the opportunity it would be great to uh, pop the slide up that i provided to you just so that people can see um, what people were thinking about sort of during lockdown so this was like this took place you know when we were in proper lockdown and just as we were emerging um, and understandably um, our children and young people um, were quite worried about um, coming back to school for various reasons uh, for you know they hadn't seen their friends for a long time so there was anxiety about their friendship there was anxiety about um, whether they were going to um, catch COVID, bring it back to their families. They were worried about what was happening about the exams. We won't say anything else about that. Um, and also about whether for those who were going to be doing exams next year and, and just all of those issues around returning to school, um, would they be able to catch up? How far behind would they be with their schoolwork? That kind of thing. Um, what we found is that um, I think
Um, but that's kind of the scene I think that we're seeing at the moment. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to say that um, at this early outset that um, the intention here is is that you know, we all on this call have expertise and shared experiences and our task therefore is not to feel that somehow, you know, Joe or Catherine and I are the experts and have all the answers um, because we all have um, scenarios that we're dealing with and, and things that are either helping uh, at the moment with settling back into school or things that we're struggling with. So just wanted to say that at the outset. Um, that um, the intention is to learn off one another. And I guess the second bit, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Catherine, is clearly what people understandably get rightfully very anxious about is whether, um, you know, we're, we're in the realms for any given young person, let alone their, their parents or their carers, in the realms of serious mental illness. But I just wanted to say at the outset that the the, the evidence nationally, as well as locally, is that invariably all of us in whatever settings will understandably be feeling a bit anxious. And that is OK and that is understandable. That's not to downplay it, but I guess it's worth stating because um, really um, what we're in the territory of is trying to enable young people to um, have safe spaces, safe opportunities where they, like the rest of us, can adjust to this ever-changing world, get back into school, see their friends, start learning and, and make progress. Um, so that will invariably be the experience of most, but clearly, um, you know, colleagues here on the call may be also wanting to sort of share with one another what to do when when help is needed and, and what that might look like. So I'll just hand over to Catherine if there's any additional observations, comments at this stage. Thank you, Phil. Um, and thank you, Joe, for setting the scene. When I was thinking about today's webinar, um, and we've done a couple before this, thinking about uh, children being anxious um, and parents, and many of you listening will be parents, so you will have had first-hand and will be having first-hand experience of this. Um, I, I was thinking, as it's very easy to get into, uh, we need to provide some answers about some magic bullets, something that will deal with our children's anxiety and parents' anxiety. And um, I had to remind myself that, you know, each of us um, uh, need to remember that feeling anxious is really normal and that part of being human is to have all these different feelings. And we can get very anxious about being anxious and um, uh, how good it would be if we could model to our children at this time um, that we can manage feelings, we can manage our own feelings, not all the time, but we can uh, accept that we can have pretty intense feelings uh, as adults and as children. Sometimes we're anxious, we're scared, we don't feel safe, um, we feel sad, but that we, we connect with those feelings and that um, if we can do that a bit more for ourselves as the adults, we're more likely then to be in a place where we can hear our children's feelings and I mean that in terms as parents but also each of you in in the myriad ways in which you come across children um, that um, in terms of the questions we've had coming up for this webinar today um, the most common question is what what can we do when children are not coping what suggestions do you have for children who are anxious what can we do and um, where we wanted to, to, to really um, focus a key message today is, and to remind us all, because I think all of us know this really, is um, uh, the process of, of listening to where this particular child is at, um, because every child is very different. There can't be one answer for each child. Um, some children, as Jo has said, has fa have found the process of going back to school good. You know, they're really pleased to get back and see their friends. Others, um, you know, many will be, what are we, we're Thursday today, we're two weeks in for a lot of children. Uh, you'll be aware that some children are really not settling in and um, they're really struggling and maybe they've not even got in at all yet. Um, 
what what do we do for those children well the number one is um is find ways of listening um you know effective communication is effective listening you know there's that phrase and how do we listen well of course there isn't a one size fits all about how to listen so um one of the particular questions was how do we hear children's covid stories how do we hear their lockdown stories and um it's we all know that with children you can't just ask a question and accept accept expect an answer it doesn't always work like that um and so in school settings um just as in home settings um we need to find creative ways of letting our children know that we're listening and that might be through storytelling it might be through uh PSHE lessons in a more formal way or less it might be through drama or art um but the base the basis for all of that is um uh, actually being interested how how is this child you know to reflect on why is this child um not managing is it something to do with um lockdown or is it something that that actually has been there a while for this particular child is there some other reason i'll give you a couple of examples and then i'll pass back to you phil um to maybe give some other other thoughts um and and also to see what's happening in the in the chat by the way we'd love to hear any thoughts in the chat so if you've got a particular question do put it there and we'll keep an eye out for it so yeah a couple of examples of just how differently uh children have found lockdown there's one uh, family talked to me about their 12 year old and actually lockdown for them was a time when they really got to know more about their daughter's ne specific needs and what became much clearer is that she's likely to have autistic spectrum disorder and um the whole luckily for them one of the parents was a key worker and so she did go into school and had much smaller groups for a while managed to create relationships in a different way with school than than she'd managed before um and um they've they've all learned a lot together the school and the parents about what to do this term in terms of the kind of support she needs in order to be less anxious you know anxiety can can often hide autism um so that's something just to hold on to anxiety can also hide all sorts of other things that we don't know about children it can hide dyslexia it can hide something else that's going on at home um i wonder if you've all heard about aces uh adverse childhood experiences this this is all about asking really what has happened in this child's life up to now um is there domestic abuse is there mental illness or chronic physical illness at home is there conflict you know what has happened or is happening to this child it's shifting our thinking when we're thinking about a child who is anxious or difficult in front of us from you know what's wrong with this child to what's happened to this child why might they be anxious and for us to be curious um so I pass back to you Phil um just for a moment uh to take on the next bit. Yeah. So um I echo Catherine's um suggestion that um do do put in comments, do put in questions in the chat because between the three of us, you know, we are monitoring that and and you will see already that our colleague behind the scenes Jo Patel has already inserted the um feedback form that it'd be great for you all to complete um at the end of this. I mean, I guess thought I'd give a slightly different slant and it might offer up some some um questions in people's minds is um in our own ways um all three of us do quite a lot of work not just with individuals but also with with schools themselves uh, and uh teachers, senkos, heads and our local authority colleagues and one thing that i've been struck by again as as a parent as well of two boys both of whom have changed schools this this year is i think in a sort of age appropriate way and of course teachers will know the kids really well parents will know their kids really well but it's just a suggestion is is sometimes we can tie ourselves up in knots as if to pretend that everything is clear and certain and we know what the pathway about the rest of the term is going to look like you know let alone the rest of the year and the reality is you know even judging from today's news where there's more news about local lockdowns in the northeast of england is actually there continues to be a high degree of uncertainty 
uh, and and also tricky though it is whether you're at work in a health setting like I do in a leadership role or whether in a school um, is actually our, t our leaders are trying as best they can to strike the right balance between keeping everybody safe whatever that means as well as actually trying to establish some getting on with business as usual so I, I I've been struck by how it can sometimes be helpful actually you know in a targeted sensible way to actually share a, a bit of that uncertainty with children themselves because they have their own eyes they have their own ears they pick up on things whether we say it out loud or not and actually just sometimes sort of sharing that you know we're muddling through is a phrase I'll often use um, or we're, we're trying to learn as we go go along is another phrase I might use actually both in relation to my own kids and in relation to other families um, that I that I see professionally actually that can help on the one hand contain worries and anxieties but also it could sort of model to our children that actually we don't have all the answers adults don't have all the answers and actually in terms of resilience building and in terms of actually you could even say problem solving on a day-by-day -day basis because that's what we're all doing um, is actually that can be really helpful because because if we don't do that the, the fallacy that we might tip into is either to say everything is OK when clearly it isn't. It's not ideally how we would want it, but neither do we want to turn everything into a, an actual disaster, catastrophe, etc. So that was a thought I had both you know, personally, but also from my professional work. And um, I thought, Joe, I mean, I wonder as as we're going through any additional thoughts that you might have. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, I was really just struck by what Catherine was saying um, and just in terms of listening uh, to our children and young people. And I know and what I was going to say is I know how hard it is to find the time <laughs> to do that for uh, homeschool link workers, for um, health staff who may only have a limited amount of time with, with people, uh, for teachers who are completely under pressure trying to get everything back up and running in their schools. I know how difficult it must be to try and find the time. And I know that we have heard from children that um, that they understand that you, you, it's difficult to find the time. But if, if there's any way to be able to actually take five minutes and to, to listen to children um, is so important. It's so important that they have uh, somebody that they trust. You know, they won't talk to anybody. You know, um, there are certain people that children trust for whatever reason. The reason they build those relationships is, is you know, you can't, it may not be the class teacher. It may be mm. the, the, you know, the wonderful uh, staff who work in the office in the school. Um, it may be, you know, um, the person who comes in to run a sports club. You know, you just don't know who that person is. And it's about making sure that you have those links in and that there is a way where, a child has the ability to be able to open open up and and speak about how they're feeling um, and that within the organization that you're working in or whether it's across the system that we that we do our best to actually um, share that information where it's appropriate uh, to be able to make sure that we can offer um, the right support to those children if they need it um, and I just think that's I think yeah having that trusted adult um is, is really important and it, it may be the parents and it's about you know making sure that you have the relationship with the parents so the parents feel able that they can come and talk to you about what about what's going on for them at home um yeah i would i think that's uh my suggestion at the moment thank you joe and, and in fact the few things i'd like to link in following on from that um the trusted adult um you may or may not all know that that there's there's so much uh, research really showing that if there's a good trusting relationship between parents and whoever is looking after a particular child, whether that's in childcare or school settings, when children know there's that trusting relationship, things always you know work out much better. That there's a good outcome. And I think one of the things about lockdown that quite a few people have said is that they've been working with parents much more and connecting with parents more. So within the health setting and the education setting. 
And how can we hold on to that now? Um, how do we make sure that the fact that we can't meet face to face with uh, parents, uh, teachers, uh, you know, whatever your role is um, in, in uh, education, um, how do we make sure that the connection still happens, even though we can't be face to face? Uh, are emails happening? Um, how do we keep them warm? How do we keep the connections going? Are there potential for Zoom calls where parents can ask questions, however small? Um, can we ask parents for advice and say, you know, we're not quite sure what's going on here. We don't quite understand, but there's something clearly not OK. Um, so that was one thing about the trusted adult. The other was linking to what you said, Phil, about, you know, showing our children that, that we're uncertain, too. And there's um, there's a, a lovely parenting program, Circle of Security. And there are two things I want to draw your attention to from that. One is that as parents, our job is to be bigger, stronger, wiser and kind. And you in your professional roles towards children, it's a similar ask in a way. How do we take on the role of doing what Phil su suggested, which is to be honest and not reassure when we can't reassure, but also be the adult. You know, they're allowed to be children and we're the adults and we can say, yeah, we don't know quite what's happening. And yes, we can feel unsure and uh, fearful. That's, that, that is what it's like right now. But um, we are here for you and we, we're going to work it out. You know, the adults will work it out as, as well as they can around you and trying to make things as good as they can be. So tell us, you know, tell us what we can do to make things better. And the second thought from Circle of Security I wanted to share with you is, is being with, which is a really key concept. And it's such a simple one, but so profound, which is that when someone is with us in the feeling that we're in, we are, uh, we actually can end up feeling that much better. And we all can end up thinking, well, I can't do anything for this child because, you know, well, what can I do? Um, but, but actually each of us has such a lot of power um, in being able to offer something to children in the way that Joe said, you know, if you're the one that this child trusts, what an amazing thing to give that child. Again, another piece of research that is consistent through a lot of uh, work around therapy and other interventions, um, education interventions too, is that having a trusted adult in your life can completely transform a child's experience. Um, you know, and that's an amazing thing that a lot of you are involved in doing for the children in, in your schools. Um, so that press of being with, that, that you may feel out of your depth sometimes, but, but sometimes that might be then about speaking to a colleague and saying, you know, this child, you know, is is really distressed or they're very angry, but I think there's something behind it that I don't really understand. And and reflecting and thinking with with a colleague, uh, your you know, your pastoral care lead, thinking together about what's your school's culture or way of uh, approaching children who are not OK. <laughs> and uh, I guess children don't always present not okay in a way that we like. You know, they can be really infuriating or irritating. They don't necessarily present in a fearful or anxious way, which in some ways is easier, isn't it? I mean, it's actually easier to 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 be empathic to a child who looks scared than a child who is being really rude and difficult. And yet behind it, there may be a huge amount of fear. You know, a child who is angry is often actually quite fearful about something. Um, so the behaviour or the way that a child presents uh, it may not be the, the way we'd like them to, but that's just how it's coming out. Um, just like we as adults don't always present things the way we wish we had. Um, yeah, Phil, any any ongoing thoughts from that? Yeah, you're making me um, think of two things. So building on from that, I think what we're touching on is how it's it's so important to try between parents and schools using that as an example to find effective ways of communicating with one another because the danger could be is that we're operating in silos so parents may absolutely know how their child is doing at home and uh, and that may look very different to what's going on at school and we know that with some you know, cohorts of um, children. So, for example, children with autistic spectrum conditions, you know, they can seemingly 
do really well in school and be managing, you know, quotes. But as soon as they get home, the, the brakes come off and they, de you know, they decompensate, they let rip. So I think it's really important. And given that this this webinar is, is not you know, specifically targeted towards parents, although many of us will be. I think it really is important for schools to just review or to think, you know, uh, and and make clear, you know, to parents, what are the ways in which they can be in touch um, with each other? Because actually that investment of time or effort will reap massive benefits for school, for home, and most importantly for the child. And, and, and I've I've heard examples of where already you know schools are taking quite a draconian approach to you know behaviour, um, and and when I heard that that's to my mind speaks more of perhaps an unhelpful way of a school and maybe some of its leadership um, team feeling that the way to restore order and get business as usual is to take quite a firm line. The danger is, is that actually that will just either drive issues or concerns underground only to resurface, or in fact, actually just provoke a very sort of hostile response, primarily within the children, because of course, we have to strike that fine balance between structure, routine, respecting authority, but also flexibility to enable them to get used to being back in school settings after so many years. So what may suit, you know, uh, perhaps a, a, a sort of leadership team within a school may or may not suit actually uh, significant numbers of children so that that's tricky so communication is one thing really that i'd i'd encourage everybody to do the best they can the other bit that was making me think about was of course we're, we're touching on resources and and what to do so i would completely echo that you know a conversation with the head of pastoral care or the deputy head you know who often takes a lead on these sorts of things can help teachers feel contained may also be a resource for parents as well but actually when we've run these um um, webinars before and if you haven't received this already then our colleagues behind the scene will send this to you is um our first one was was on the back of a, a letter that that i compiled with input from all my colleagues across um you know surrey and borders which was articulating um some of the resources um that are available because at one end of the spectrum in terms of resources absolutely you may feel that you're doing the best you possibly can within your school setting but actually you are worried that you know this person young person may have you know depression um, or an eating disorder or something so of course you know there are routes and mechanisms for making referrals in but equally uh, further down the scale it may be that actually you can be put in touch with, you know, your school's allocated primary mental health um, worker or the mental health support teams that are in some areas. Or there will be um, 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 short videos um, in relation to some of the areas that we're touching on that are available through, you know, the Surrey and Borders website. So if you haven't received that letter, don't worry if you receive it again because we just want to make sure that everybody gets it but but it may prompt some questions in the chat around you know mm. particular issues that you know you're doing your best with but still there's a need that you don't feel you can meet yourself i've got some other thoughts to share um thinking about what what you all can do what we can all do um and one, one, one is about you yourself uh, and about us, that you know, when you are with a child, um, what state of mind are you in before you start? Uh, what do they see in your face? And I'm thinking of the way children can say, oh, you know, I didn't like the way she looked or the way she smiled didn't look quite real or she was so busy, I didn't really want to bother her or, my worry is a bit too small, I think, to bother her with. You know, how do you prepare your 
state of mind and your body language to say, I'm here, um, I'm here, you know, I'm, hi I'm here, I'm ready to listen. Um, and uh, that changes everything. And certainly one of the first people that I trained with when I was training as a child psychiatrist said, you know, children will pick up whether they think you are ready to hear. Um, and she was talking specifically about hearing a child who might have been sexually abused. She said, they won't tell you if they think you're going to be too shocked to hear what they've got to say. But that's, it's not just about that, it's about anything a child might want to say. They need to know that you can bear hearing it and you're not going to jump in with a quick reassurance or a quick uh, way of saying, oh, don't worry, that'll be all right. And we all do it. We all do it so easily with children. Um, so that process of being in a state of mind uh, and being honest with yourself, whether it's a moment that you can offer uh, to a child or whether you need to take a, a, you know, three breaths of your own before you can offer it. Um, and I guess related to that is something that we've talked about in the other webinars, which is so important. And it's um, how, how, um, how do you look after your own health and your own emotional well-being? Um, have you allowed yourself or been able to take a break this summer? If not, it's not too late, you know. Uh, take a day, take a weekend, take a moment for yourself, take an hour, take some time, which are for you, uh, which is really for you, and, um, uh, you know, have some nurture for yourself, because that puts all of us in a much better place to do what we really want to do in terms of supporting children. Um, moving on to another thing that we can all do, coming at it from a different perspective, is um, uh, something that I called the four P's, I think, in our last webinar. And uh, it, it's perhaps a way of approaching what you might do. Um, uh, so the first of the P's was predict. You know, can you, if you've got a child who still isn't settling into school, um, is there something you, you, you can predict about that? Uh, or, or could we anticipate why that is? Is there anything that can give you an idea about what's going on? Um, uh, you know, whether it's about the fact that the school setting is still a bit chaotic, which is completely understandable. Is it that their year bubble have had to go home? What, what, what clues are there in terms of why this child's struggling? What do you know about or what don't you know about what's going on at home? And can you be curious about it? The, the second P is, is parents, you know, speak with parents, find out what, what they can help you with in terms of understanding. And the third is planning. And this very much, I think, is, is related to questions that we've had in all the webinars about, and Phil alluded to, to, alluded to, to it earlier, children with ASD particularly, or ADHD, where sensory overload, um, you know, too much going on, too much noise, uh, too many demands, uh, all those things that can be very common for a child with ASD. Um, you know, the fact that planning really helps. I mean, it helps all of us. But if you've got a child who doesn't seem to be managing, can you do a visual planning for the day? Can you be really clear what the timetable looks like? Do they need it writing down in a different way? Um, a, a pictorial diary works wonders for a lot of children, actually, in terms of being able to see where they're at in the day. Um, and the fourth P was pause, just to pause and reflect, you know, get a colleague to think with, you know, what else can we try? What creative ideas have we got? Um, and I guess related to that is um, that it can just take time and that rem remembering that every child's going to be different at the speed with which they can um, find their way into school. Uh, some will take quite a long time to manage the these hellos and goodbyes of coming into school and going home after this break. Um, and those who aren't managing it, um, what what can we do to 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 really build on uh, their confidence and their self-esteem by hearing what they've got to say and tweaking something and maybe going slower. Maybe they still can't quite manage to come in every day or for the whole day. What what will work? Because then you can build on that. Mm. Jo, I was wondering whether any um, thoughts have been, further thoughts have yeah. been sparked off for you. 
Yeah, a couple of things really. I mean, just to follow up on what Catherine was just saying was I had an interesting conversation with somebody that I know personally who's got a son uh, with ASD who hasn't actually really been in school for about two years, um, just hasn't been coping at all, hasn't been managing. Um, but actually during last term, he managed to go in. You know, he was classed as a, a child that, you know, should be in school. And so he actually managed to go into the school that he was at going to for about two weeks because the reason that he hadn't been allowed, he hadn't been to school for the two months previously was because it wasn't his fault. It was COVID, you know, it stopped him being able to go to school, whereas previously it had been something within himself that had stopped him going into school. Um, and because that something seemed to trigger in him that actually this time it wasn't down to him that he wasn't able to go to school and he actually managed to go to school for two whole weeks, which is has been unheard of in their family. So um, it is interesting how children's bright brains work and how how they kind of um, rationalise things. So I just wanted to kind of share that because I, I was, um, well, personally really pleased that he'd actually managed to go to school. But, you know, just in the thought processes that they'd had. Um, but following up on what uh, Phil was saying about sort of where to, um, you know, look for help, you know, and the SAB information is, is really, really useful. And, and I know there has been a lot of information out there. Um, but I would just say for those, um, I know sort of across secondary schools in, in Surrey, about 60% of you have um, relational workers from charities working with you in schools. Um, and and please do use those and also look out into the local community because a lot of our charities are getting back up and running and are offering, uh, beginning to offer uh, their after school activities and their youth activities and and, um, and please do sort of pass, pass, pass your young children who may be struggling onto them because they are brilliant, especially at the lower end at the sort of uh, early, early stages of, of children struggling in whatever way they're, they're great at building those relationships and, and working with those children and young people. So, um, you know, do be aware. And if you're not quite sure what's available in your area, but would you know, like to investigate further, then please do get in touch uh, with me. Just drop me an email. Um, I'm sure my email will be available somewhere. Um, I'll be happy to help out. Um, yeah, and again, charities, just following up on what Phil was saying about parents, charities worked a lot with parents. They normally just work with the young people. Um, but they've spent a lot of time over over lockdown and over the last six months talking to um, uh, talking to parents and supporting them in, ha in providing strategies to to work and help with their young people. Um, I'm just sorry, I've just seen Alex's comment in the um, chat, and I just wanted to say, yeah, completely. I was in a meeting, and I was talking to somebody who ran a family support team in London and they'd managed to get hold of masks that had a clear plastic um, section in the middle so that children could see their mouths. And so it was it was less intimidating and um, and, and less, you know, it was able, which was one mainly for young children as opposed to children with hearing difficulties. But but yeah, so they are available. Um, um, so that children can see your mouth moving, which kind of is, is less intimidating, obviously useful for those with hearing difficulties. So sorry, just as a complete aside yeah. there. <laughs> I, w I was thinking of picking up partly from where you've taken us to, Joe, but also Lucy um, has put a, a question in the chat about safe spaces. Um, and I guess what that was making me think was was two things is is um, for some people, you know, and especially young people with autism or ADHD, um, you know, lockdown has been the best thing since sliced bread because, you know, they've been able to, you know, avoid social contact, avoid potential classroom conflict, you know, if you've got disruptive behaviour, um, get rightly or wrongly, get more into a sort of social media based world, playing games, you know, they may or may not then have, you know, been up half the night and then for sleeping most of the day and routine has gone a bit out of the window. So I think I think it's worth reminding ourselves that, you know, lockdown for some children has been brilliant and for other children, it has been awful. Mm. And so that's a huge range of spectrum of experience that, you know, start of new term, it's relatively, you know, I always think terms 
sure teachers won't agree with me, but I always think it flies by so quickly. So there's not much time. And yet, you know, academic pressures, you know, expectations of teachers to deliver as well as for kids to learn are huge. So I think we need to bear that in mind. And when it comes to sort of how we we deal with, you know, the, the sensory needs of kids, I, I'm always struck, you know, and, and I'm saying this from a sort of one of the roles I have is a strategic leadership role working with, you know, e executives in the local education authority is that for understandable reasons, there is a continuing drive to enable as many young people, whether autistic, ADHD or not, to receive mainstream education because we know that actually sometimes, you know, um, placements um, out of that setting can actually be counterproductive. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, the, the finances of all of that. I'm talking about the experience. So you've got this tension where kids, you know, are put together, but they have varying needs. Now, from my experience of having walked around a, th a few schools already is actually for some, for some young people with ASD, the fact that there is social distancing and that we've got bubbles and that there's attempts to do more and more learning outside um, and that you know we've got one-way systems may actually be really helpful for other kids it may be intensely annoying let alone you know difficult for the teachers to implement and remind kids to stick to but but i guess when I talk about spaces, I, I'm meaning it in two senses of the word. I'm meaning it in terms of psychologically, you know, as Catherine said, you know, when we approach a young person or are speaking to a young person, what do we bring to that interaction? If we look as if we're untrustworthy, unsafe, our minds are cluttered, we don't have the time to spend with them. If they pick up on that, an autistic kid especially will 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 pick that up and and not be able to sort of tolerate that degree of of uh, of perception or misperception so there's psychological safe spaces and then of course there's physical spaces and again i completely appreciate that you know schools um have restricted space um, you've got to socially distance and so then well what do you what, what might you do if a child is having a meltdown in the middle of a classroom setting that you've already had to you know um, socially distance young young children um, so it is going to be hard but it but it but it may well be that actually we do the best we can with what we can do so it may be that temper for momentarily you might have a time out card um, or you might have a sort of warning light visual system, um, green, amber, red, so that a young person might be able to let you know if they're starting to feel overwhelmed. Um, increasingly, lots of schools are trying to introduce, um, you know, autism friendly accreditation or schemes like that. Now, of course, that might be hampered by, you know, the current COVID restrictions in terms of implementation. But but what I would what I would say trumps everything in my experience is it's the attitude of the teachers, uh, including the leadership team, that by far trumps whether or not you've literally got enough physical spaces because it's the attitude, a, a helpful, constructive, forgiving, slightly permissive, not at all costs, but you know, flexibility approach that especially in these times overall i am convinced um will reap benefits both for individual young people with asd but therefore also how whole classes can be managed and learning can be continued mm. um, those are just my thoughts I'll, I'll hand back to to either of my colleagues for the moment yes i could i could share a few thoughts link you know that, that are sparked by both of the the the, uh, the contributions you've given um, one is around um, something that we have to, to, to kind of bear in mind and has been in my mind today because of watching a, a, um, a webinar from For Baby's Sake, which looks at domestic violence and they've just released a film about the effect on babies. 
um, and that we know that there's more domestic violence uh, since lockdown and that when you have an anxious child, uh, we have to be honest enough to think, you know, what's going on at home? And it's really important to be open to that being why a child might be struggling. You know, what, what's happening at home for this child? Um, um, and, and that, that you know, please reach out in terms of resources. One of the things that we want to be able to do through uh, using the digital um, technology we've got is to think of ways. Are there other ways that we in SABP you know, and in the voluntary sector can support you in giving children what they need? You know, are there other methods of support that we could set up to support you in the jobs you're doing in hearing what children have got to tell you? Because that's um, we, we can only any any of us do this work by having colleagues who we can share and reflect with so we know what to do. Um, in terms of resources, again, Phil said that he's going to send some out and and I think it's in a sense, it's very much about finding a resource that works within your setting and and sharing it and supporting each other to use. Just a couple I wanted to mention, though, is that um, uh, there are books called Books Beyond Words that were mentioned in another webinar. Uh, and they've just published a couple that are free to download on the website, that's Beyond Words, um, that you might find useful with some primary age children, particularly, maybe, maybe you know, it could be secondary, but, um, uh, and they're books about, you know, being in lockdown and going back to school. So they are designed to use pictures uh, to enable a child to tell their story. So that's one way of helping a child tell their COVID story, if you like. Um, and find the transition into school if it's difficult. Another is that um, Joe and I are jointly um, uh, doing a Facebook page through um, uh, a, con a consortium of, of charities across Surrey. Um, and Joe, Joe Patel behind the scenes might put this up again at the link on the chat. Um, and the aim of that is for parents. So in fact, the one that will be coming out this week is very much around the same topic of today, going back to school and giving some tips and thoughts to parents around um, how to support themselves and their children. But they're also in the resource section of that Facebook page. Um, there's information that you might find helpful from previous postings over the summer. Um, the aim of them is to be accessible, short postings. And you might find one that you want to download to give a parent or to point to, to point the parent towards. Um, um, and then the last thing I wanted to say, I'm, I'm aware of time, Phil, but, but just I wanted to give yeah, there's one particular family that's come into my mind that I wanted to mention who I've been speaking to recently. And um, it's a boy who is finding it. Uh, he's a primary age boy who's very anxious in school. And um, it's related to his experience in his last school um, when it's only come out recently because he didn't have the language to explain how the, the teachers were managing his behaviour. And it seems that they got into quite a punitive um, relationship with him. And the parents are feeling desperately guilty and heartbroken that that's why he's so anxious now. Um, and uh, they are very conflicted around, well, you know, do we talk about this stuff? Because that was in the past. Shouldn't we just be getting on with it? And, um, and I think, again, I wanted to share that because we can all, I think, get into that. You know, do we talk with children about what's happened or do we say, let's just move on? And... Uh, of course, Phil and I, in our roles and, and our trainings and experiences, psychiatrists and psychotherapists will say that doesn't always work. And, you know, the past comes up in the present. And so when you see a child who's not OK, it may well be that the past is coming up in the present and and talking about it or finding a way of resolving it through all sorts of creative type of therapeutic methods, of which there are many, may be what's needed. Um, we can't always just say um, maybe it's best not to talk about it. There's a great worry, I think, isn't there, in our culture that we're opening a Pandora's box. Um, it's not opening a Pandora's box to be able to say, you know, how are you? And to find out, how, how are you really? You know. Thank you, Catherine. I'm just conscious before I sort of wrap up on behalf of us and I sort of let everybody on the call know about some of our vision and plan for next steps. I was just wondering, Joe, if there's any sort of final observations you might have. No, I don't really have any words of wisdom or little pearls of wisdom, I don't think. Um, but I do just I just think uh, time, listen and time. I think, um, you know, just going back to where we started, really. 
I think um, time's precious and, and there's not much of it, it appears to be. <laughs> we all seem to be incredibly busy and busy and it's getting busier. Um, but I think where our children and young people are concerned, if we can find moments, you know, where we can stop, uh, not look at our phones, not think about what lesson we're going to go and teach next um, and actually listen um, to them, um, we'll reap rewards further down the line, I think. So thank you. Yeah. Brilliant. So just in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to share with everybody here where where we've got to um, in our sort of thinking and possible next step. So we're, we're really grateful that so many of you both signed up and have stuck with us for, you know, the whole hour. Um, we're really excited, you know, um, about the possibilities that this, you know, format, this opportunity creates um, for us to work with you and your colleagues out there across Surrey. And, and where my thinking has got to, and I'm at the early stages of trying to map this out with colleagues, and, and obviously I'd love your feedback as to what might um, sit well with you or your colleagues, is we're thinking that thus far the webinars, you know, have either been, you know, Catherine and me as two doctors, uh, uh, um, on our own or with you know Joe joining us for this one and the last one so over, over time we've broadened out or tested out broadening out you know who who hosts these who participates but actually we're thinking about getting bolder and braver so I'm in the early stages of talking with a range of professionals about who might um, um, host webinars like this going forward so that's one thing um, so I'm looking to health colleagues, I'm looking to education colleagues, local authority, voluntary colleagues. So do get in touch with us if if that is of interest to you. And also what I'm what I'm trying to start mapping out is a, a potentially a range of of topics or areas that people would want us to focus on. So deliberately, we've been thinking about settling into school and, you know, return to school type anxiety. But actually, there is an opportunity to go far broader in terms of a range of topics. And of course, linked to that then is we might do fairly um, broad brush um, strokes approach in terms of the participation and it's so many of you come from a range of backgrounds but actually we may well also want to do some very targeted sort of webinars so you know um, Catherine and I um, already sort of planning a very targeted webinar for our general practitioner colleagues you know details will be shared in due course but but actually there may be specific things that education colleagues social care colleagues might want so I'd really encourage you in your feedback forms both to tell us how you've experienced today but also do give us as many pointers as possible because because we do want to um, um, offer and help deliver something that, that that lands on the ground and that is experienced well. And I guess the final bit is we are also thinking about what we might do in, um, for parents um, because we're conscious this is for professionals at the moment. So I'm in the process of trying to map out what is it that we already do for parents across the system and what added value could something like this have alongside that so and if I'm um, Phil I might just also add that yeah. the the one of the things that we know very much through our professional careers and journeys is that uh, having support from colleagues and having re reflective places to speak and talk and share is important um, that may or may not be something that we can help with but but we're really curious whether we can so getting together groups of you know whether that's multidisciplinary or just your particular group and having um, facilitators who can help that. We know that really helps what we do with children and families. So we're also interested in your thoughts or responses or, or what you need or want on that too. Yeah, so look, um, we've gone a bit over the hour. Hope um, that's okay. Um, we're going to end here. Have a good rest of the day, all of you, and a good rest of the week. And um, we'll continue being in touch um, over the coming days and weeks. Take care now. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.